so today what I'd like to talk to you about is how neural circuits can be used to control bleeding. Uh, so just to give you some uh, background first, and uh, Peter and Yaakov have done an excellent job of recapping the inflammatory reflex, but basically our studies are based on this uh, neural circuit, uh, which was uh, coined by Kevin Tracy. And the inflammatory reflex is an endogenous mechanism that allows the brain to monitor and regulate inflammation through the vagus nerve. So as we've heard, the afferent vagus nerve can send cytokines in the periphery and send a signal to inform the brain. The brain can then downregulate systemic inflammation uh, through efferent vagus nerve signaling to the spleen. And this combination of afferent and efferent vagus nerve signaling uh, completes the circuit and comprises the inflammatory reflex. And over the past 10 to 15 years, some of the key components of the efferent pathway, which we call the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, have been elucidated, such as the spleen, uh, T lymphocytes, and the uh, alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is on the surface of the cytokine-producing uh, tissue macrophages. Now, in addition to elucidating these key components, what Dr. Tracy's laboratory and others have done around the world is show how to harness this system, harness this circuit, uh, and provide beneficial cholinergic stimulation, either through uh, electricity to the vagus nerve or by administering a drug, a cholinergic agonist, to activate the circuit. And I think you'll recognize many of these diseases. Uh, some of them are the leading uh, causes of death and morbidity uh, in our culture uh, and around the world where cholinergic stimulation has been found to be beneficial. Now, as Peter mentioned, I'm a, a trauma surgeon by training. And uh, so let me just uh, uh, digress just for a few moments. I think that with surgery, or to practice surgery safely and successfully, there are several obstacles. I think there are three primary obstacles that we've had to overcome. The first obstacle is controlling pain. And a major advance in surgery occurred back in 1846 uh, at what is now known as the Ether Dome up at Massachusetts General Hospital when Dr. William Morton performed the first public surgery using, using ether as general anesthesia. The second obstacle is controlling infection. And a major breakthrough here happened in the 1860s by way of Sir Joseph Lister. And Joseph Lister advocated the use of carbolic acid to sterilize the surgical instruments, to sterilize the wounds, and actually even sprayed it on the surgeon's hands uh, to provide sterility. And this was a, a, another major breakthrough and significantly reduced surgical mortality rates uh, up until that point from infection. Now, the third obstacle is controlling bleeding. And judging from this more modern photo, I propose that we have a lot more work to do. <laughs> For example, in trauma, uh, in traumatic injury, bleeding is still the most common preventable cause of death. And if you don't think that trauma is important, trauma is the fifth leading cause of death in this country. It's the number one cause of death of children and the number one cause of death of adults up to the age of 45. It's an even larger cause of death around the world. In addition to trauma and trauma surgery, if you just look at people who are undergoing surgery, and there are tens of millions of people who undergo surgery every year, we don't administer any drugs or don't have any therapies to give them prior to surgery to prevent them from bleeding. We give anesthetics, we give pain medicine to prevent pain, we give antibiotics and use antimicrobial scrubs to prevent infection but we don't give anything to a normal healthy person undergoing surgery to prevent bleeding. Now, we know that a lot of people here have probably had surgery, so not everyone is bleeding to death during surgery. So we have, we have ways to stop bleeding, but why not stop or why not prevent the problem before it occurs? So based on this, what I consider really a monumental surgical problem, clinical problem, and our work on the inflammatory reflex, we reason that the brain can control bleeding through the vagus nerve, and the term neural tourniquet was born. And what we found first was that stimulation of the vagus nerve with electricity can control bleeding. This is our bleeding uh, study led by Christopher Zura, uh, 
uh, working with pigs in Vienna, Austria. And Chris developed an ear laceration and hemorrhage model. And what we found was that providing electrical vagus nerve stimulation to the pigs, the stimulation occurs in the neck of the pig, significantly reduces the duration of the hemorrhage from the pig ear. And it also significantly reduces the amount of blood that the pig, that reduces the blood lost from the pig ears by up to 50%. To identify a mechanism for these findings, we started looking at the serine protease thrombin. Now thrombin, as, ma as many of you know, is a uh, critical clotting enzyme. It's also a marker of clot formation. So essentially, more thrombin equals more clotting. And what we found was that looking at the blood that was coming out of the pig ears, by providing vagus nerve stimulation, you significantly increase the amount of thrombin uh, that, the, that is found in the blood. And the thrombin, uh, or the surrogate for thrombin, is something called TAT, which is thrombin antithrombin complex. So vagus nerve stimulation significantly increases the amount of thrombin. And so this suggests that the decreased bleeding can be explained by increased clot formation at the site of the injury. Now based on these initial encouraging findings, uh, my lab assistant Jason Fritz and I then developed a more severe hemorrhage model, what we would consider a lethal uh, bleeding model uh, in rats, which, which, is, which consists of a penetrating liver injury. So what we wanted to do was simulate the sort of non-compressible internal bleeding that is responsible for many trauma-related deaths. What we also did was, instead of using vagus nerve stimulation for these experiments, we administered the pharmacological cholinergic agonist nicotine uh, to activate the neural circuit. And this research was funded by the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, which is the largest surgical society dedicated to traumatic injury and obviously uh, very interested in this sort of work. So they say that a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And these are the beakers that we use to collect the blood from the injured livers. So on the left uh, is the beaker we use to collect blood from an animal pre-treated with vehicle, which is just saline. And on the right is the beaker that we use to collect the blood from the animals treated or pre-treated with nicotine. And if you were the animal who's bleeding, which one would you rather be? Now we can't predict who suffers from trauma, so those were pretreatments with the drug, but this is treatment with the drug after the onset of the hemorrhage. And what you can see is that therapeutic nicotine administration also significantly reduces the amount of blood loss from the injured livers. And if you pay attention to the y-axis where the amount of blood loss is in milliliters, five milliliters may not seem like a lot to you, uh, but for the size rats that we were using, this approaches 50% of their blood volume. That's as if someone my size lost about three liters of blood. And that certainly is highly lethal. Now many of you know that nicotine is a potent vasoconstrictor. Uh, and so what we, we aim to determine is whether nicotine is reducing blood loss by essentially reducing blood flow through the liver, choking off the blood supply, and then the animal won't bleed from the liver. So what we did was measure microvascular hepatic blood flow. We used a laser Doppler perfusion system. Perfusion is on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the time in minutes after the administration of the drug. So normally, when we gave nicotine uh, or the control, we would wait about 30 to 40 minutes before, penetrating, before the penetrating liver injury. But what we found, very interestingly, is that nicotine is actually increasing the microvascular blood flow through the liver and if you look at the 30 to 40 minute time span, which is when the animal's uh, livers would be injured, there's actually increased blood flow through the liver at that time. So we feel that this argues against uh, a, a sort of a vasoconstrictive effect of nicotine. Uh, we don't see that. So we then took a, a page out of Chris's uh, pig playbook, uh, where vagus nerve stimulation increased thrombin production, which is increasing clot formation. And we wanted to see if nicotine uh, can do the same in our rat hemorrhage model. So on the y-axis, we have our TAT complex, which is a measure of thrombin production. On the left side of the graph, this is blood that is systemic blood, so it's uh, circulating. It's not at the site of the injury. And what you can see is that there's really no difference between animals that receive vehicle uh, and animals that receive nicotine in the systemic circulation. There's no increase in thrombin production. 
However, if you look on the right of the graph, which is the local, so this is blood that's actually coming from the liver at the site of injury, you see that nicotine doubles the amount of thrombin production compared with the saline treatment. So this is a, what we consider a specific acceleration of clot formation at the site of the injury, whereas in the circulating blood, uh, there is no increase in thrombin. And so we also think this would be advantageous because if you had increased systemic thrombin, the animal might suffer distant thromboembolic events, stroke, myocardial infarction, uh, which would not be uh, what we wanted. So based on these encouraging uh, findings and that encouraging model, we've now moved into a third experimental bleeding model. Uh, this is now in mice. And in this model, we uh, cut the tip of the tail of the mouse approximately two to three millimeters, not very much, uh, and then we measure the time that the animal bleeds from the tail. It's pretty simple. What you can see on the left uh, with bleeding time on the y-axis is that electrical vagus nerve stimulation in this model and just as in the pigs significantly reduces the duration of the hemorrhage in the mice. In addition to providing electrical vagus nerve stimulation, we also administered our cholinergic agonist nicotine in this model. And you can see that nicotine also significantly and dose-dependently reduces the bleeding time. Uh, you can see that our highest dose of nicotine, 2 milligrams per kilogram, essentially results in a 50% reduction in the duration of the hemorrhage. To replicate our findings from the pig model and the rat models that cholinergic stimulation can accelerate clot formation and increase thrombin production, we again measured both the local thrombin production at the site of the injury and also the circulating thrombin. And again, thrombin is uh, measured by the TAT complex, which is on the y-axis. So looking at the circulating blood, so this is blood that was drawn from the inferior vena cava of the animal. Uh, you can see that nicotine does not increase systemic thrombin production, systemic TAT concentrations. However, just as in the pigs and just as in the rats, if you look at the site of the injury, at the tail, we have a 50% increase in TAT production uh, over the vehicle levels at the site of the injury when we administer nicotine to these animals. So that is, this is now the third animal model where we're accelerating clot formation locally and specifically at the site of the injury. Now, as we've been performing these experiments, we've been doing them for, for quite a number of years, uh, there's, there's really a simple but fundamental question that keeps coming up. And that question is, how can a nerve innervate a clot? How can you stimulate the vagus nerve in the neck of an animal, in the neck of the mouse, and control bleeding in the tail? Because the vagus nerve does not go to the tail. Well. As I mentioned before, our work is based on the inflammatory reflex, and in the inflammatory reflex, the vagus nerve is controlling inflammation through its connection to the spleen. So we reason that perhaps the vagus nerve and the brain is innervating and educating circulating cells in the blood as they pass through the spleen, and educating these cells to respond more quickly uh, when they see an injury. The most logical cell to start studying is the platelet, as its main job is uh, clot formation. So we measured platelet activation using fax analysis, a fairly standard uh, assay, uh, been done for many years. And we measure platelet activation using two mechanistic markers, two activation markers. Uh, so on these fax dot plots, uh, on the y-axis, the first measure is using an antibody called John A. Uh, and John A is an antibody that is specific for the active conformation of the primary fibrinogen receptor of the platelet, which is known as 2B3A. And, and on the x-axis, we are measuring P-selectin, the antibody against P-selectin. And P-selectin is released from the alpha granules of activated platelets. So these are two separate mechanisms, two separate markers of platelet activation. What we're also using are two different agonists for platelets. The first is ADP. Uh, which is in the middle, and then thrombin on the right. So if you look at the leftmost dot plot, which is uh, control, you can see that these platelets would be uh, considered quiescent. So more than 98% of them are in the left lower quadrant. There's no binding of John A, no binding of P-selectin. 
If you administer ADP as your agonist, you can see that we're moving up the, really the y-axis and have much more John A binding. So we're activating the fibrinogen receptor. If we administer thrombin, which is a little bit more potent uh, agonist than ADP, not only do you have more of the John A binding, but then you get your P-selectin binding, uh, and they, they move into the upper right quadrant. So we have two different ways to activate the platelets and two different uh, markers uh, of platelet activation. So what we first started doing was measuring the circulating platelets from animals that were treated with either saline or nicotine. So we treated the animals, we waited an hour, and then we drew their blood from the inferior vena cava. Uh, and the hour is the same time point that we would wait before we would injure the tail. But these animals do not have a tail injury. So what you can see in the circulating blood, comparing vehicle with nicotine, is that their platelets are also quiescent. They're not activated greater than 98%, close to 99% uh, for the nicotine, are sitting in the left lower quadrant. So this therapy, uh, which again, given really the same time before we would injure the tail, is not activating the platelets. However, if we then take these platelets and stimulate them ex vivo with thrombin, which is what we're trying to do is simulate what happens when the platelet would see an injury in the animal, something very interesting happens. What we found is that the platelets from the animals treated with nicotine respond much more robustly to the thrombin stimulation than animals that did not see nicotine that were just treated with saline. And this is a two-fold increase in activation as measured by the fold change of John A, which is the fibrinogen receptor, and the, the CD62P, which is P-selectin. So we've activated two different pathways in the platelet and so we refer to this phenomenon as a priming effect uh, because, again, it requires the additional uh, step of the thrombin stimulation. Now, while we saw a very nice effect with thrombin, when we went to our other agonist, which is ADP, so these animals received saline or nicotine, we waited an hour, we took out the circulating blood, and then stimulated with ADP, which activates the platelets, we do not see any priming effect in animals that receive nicotine. They're essentially uh, the same amount of uh, binding with John A with the fibrinogen receptor. So while the thrombin uh, priming effect is there, the ADP effect is not. So this, is, this priming effect, cholinergic priming effect, is specific for a thrombin pathway. Well, if we're priming platelets and we're based on the inflammatory reflex, we have to be priming them in the spleen. So we reason that if we remove the spleen, we should not be able to prime the platelets when we administer the drug. And sure enough, what we found in animals that underwent splenectomy five or six days prior to this experiment, they were administered saline or nicotine. You can see that the nicotine on the right is unable to prime these platelets. In fact, which it really reached statistical significance, these platelets are less activated in splenectomized animals when they receive the nicotine. It's the complete opposite effect. So, based on this, we're not priming platelets in splenectomized animals, so the spleen is necessary. Well, if, we, if platelet priming in the spleen is so critical to controlling bleeding, we hypothesize that the splenectomized mice should not respond to nicotine in terms of reduced bleeding. And that is exactly what we found. So with the bleeding time on the y-axis, if you look at these sham splenectomized mice, which are on the left, you can see that nicotine very nicely and significantly reduces the bleeding time, as expected. However, in the animals that underwent a splenectomy several days prior, the ability for nicotine to control bleeding is completely abolished. And please remember that even though these animals do not have a spleen, the nicotine is circulating in the blood with the platelets. So if the platelets could respond to the nicotine directly, you would, you would reason that we should be able to stop bleeding and prime them. But clearly, as you can see, we're unable to prime them, and we are unable to control bleeding uh, without a spleen. If we move along or move within the spleen, again, based on the inflammatory reflex, the alpha-7, the molecular receptor that's essential to the anti-inflammatory effects, should also be necessary to, to control hemostasis. 
So we repeated the experiment. Instead of splenectomizing the animals, we took the alpha-7 knockout mice, genetically deficient in alpha-7. And this graph, just to go back, looks pretty similar to not having a spleen, not having the alpha-7 receptor. Uh, the wild-type animals on the left respond very nicely to nicotine, reduced bleeding. The animals on the right, which again are, ge are genetically deficient in alpha-7, nicotine has absolutely no effect. So this tells us we believe that the alpha-7 receptor is essential to cholinergic-enhanced hemostasis. And if we can't control bleeding in alpha-7 animals, and platelet priming is that important, well then we shouldn't be able to prime their platelets either. And what you can see here, again, just like in splenectomized animals, if you give nicotine to an animal that does not have alpha-7, not only do they not prime, but it, it's, this is not statistically significant, but certainly going in the wrong direction, uh, that these platelets uh, do not respond appropriately. Uh, they are almost inactivated in the alpha-7 knockout mice. So what we have now is a, is a much more uh, detailed illustration of this neural circuit that controls bleeding, which we again refer to as the neural tourniquet. So through a vagus nerve pathway to the spleen, the brain can convert resting circulating platelets into primed platelets that are then go into the circulation and are ready to respond to any injury. This effect requires alpha-7. And this neural circuit allows the body to respond quickly and safely to injury and bleeding as we are priming the platelets rather than activating them so we can restrict the accelerated clot formation only uh, to sites of injury. Thank you very much.